The following podcast is a proud member of the Blue Collar Roots Network. Find all the shows by visiting bluecollarroots.com. Here's the president and primary owner of True Tech Tools, licensed engineer, and the nicest BS artist you will ever meet, Bill Spohn. Welcome back to another episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Our goal of Building HVAC Science is to help create the crossroads between HVAC and building performance technicians. Today's episode, How to Market Invisible Performance, we'll be speaking with Max Rohr, who is formerly with Ray Howe as the Marketing and Academy Manager for Building Solutions. He'll spend some time with us today explaining the process of creating and marketing products to move energy and water, typically thought of as radiant heating and cooling systems, as well as some discussion on plumbing applications with PEX. We'll learn about both Max's background and the background of the Ray Howe company, which has 20,000 employees in 55 countries and operates in five distinct marketing areas globally. This episode was recorded in February of 2020. Let's listen in as Max describes to us how to market invisible performance. Good morning, Max. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you. And you're with Ray Howe. I am. Tell us a little bit about Ray Howe and as a company, what they do, a little bit of company history, and then we'll talk about yourself and your history. Sure. So Ray Howe is a global polymer manufacturing company. And way back in 1948, our company founder, it's still a family run business, which is cool. They were out of leather for shoes post-war. So he started making things out of plastic and it snowballed from there. So some of the early hits for us where the Volkswagen Bug used to have like a leather handle for the passenger to hold above the window. We figured out a way to make that out of plastic and then started extruding other things. The big hit for us right now globally is automotive industry things. So a common thing that you would see like a Mercedes bumper on a lot of cars in the US, Rayhow builds those and paints those and adds all the sensors and things like that. And then the division that I'm in, is the construction division. So PEX pipe is our main product and we use that for heating and plumbing and that type of thing. Great. I didn't realize that's where PEX came from. Yeah. So it's something that we've been doing the same since 1967. So we put a different jacket on top of the PEX, but we use the same PEX A process that we've always used and just make it application specific with basically the paint that we put on the most outer layer. Cool. So tell us about Max. So I grew up in the industry. My dad did uh, radiant heating way back in the 80s, and I worked with him in our family business as an installer. And then the joke that I usually have with that is that I don't know what he would tell you if the Bureau of Child Labor asked when I started working, because I think that I went as part of a daycare program that I would just go with my dad to work and then just jam plumber's putty into all the tools and sit next to the toolbox while he worked. So. I've been around the industry for a long time. I worked with him as an installer. I've worked at the wholesale level, manufacturing rep level, and now again at the manufacturer level. I looked you up on LinkedIn. Your title is Marketing and Academy Manager. Tell me what that means. I have somehow found a career (laughs) where I train people and am in charge of, as of September, additionally, the marketing aspect. I don't have formal backgrounds in either of those things. I don't have like an education degree or anything like that. I just know our customers pretty well and was able to convince the people at Rayhow that it would be a good idea to give me the capacity to do the training and, and marketing. So hopefully that's going well for everyone involved. But yeah, I just, I love the industry. I love our people and have grown up in this environment. So I have a pretty good feel for what we like as an industry and what we don't like. You seem to have a very good way of communicating just right here and now, and you certainly have passion. (laughs) You probably still have plumber's putty under your fingernails too. Yeah, probably. It's the smell that reminds me of my childhood. Do you have one of those? Like a corn dog at a state fair or something like that, but that's like what I remember. (laughs) Mine's probably spaghetti sauce. We're Italian family, so. Okay, yeah, that'll work. (laughs) So this is the Building HVAC Science Podcast. So we're talking about sort of the intersection of building science and HVAC, and certainly radiant heating and cooling is a big part of it because they exist for space conditioning, mainly for people. So 
what's your passion topics that you talk about now in your training for the relate to Ray Howe? Sure. So the things that I like to talk about most are radiant heating and cooling in general. Radiant cooling, I think, is one of the most underutilized technologies because back in the early days of radiant, the company that my parents owned was in Park City, Utah. So it was a lot of wealthy second home ski area people that had big houses. And radiant was kind of a luxury item in that way that if you had the money, you would get a nice radiant heating system and it was very cold in the mountains. So it was a small market for radiant. What we've found in the last couple decades is that it actually makes a ton of sense comfort wise for all sorts of different buildings. And then on the energy efficiency side, that's where we'll actually get into projects. Don't even necessarily care about the comfort side of things in a warehouse or a big aviation hangar, but they might save 30% on the energy to keep that building warm. And then the floors are also warm as just an added benefit. So that's where radiant heating is scaling into commercial a little bit better. And it's not just a luxury item. And also the cost of installing these systems has gone down since people have figured out how to use them and contractors are more familiar with them. But the big growth area would be radiant cooling because radiant heating still makes most sense if it's a cooling or a heating dominated market. So if you're going to be north of the Mason Dixon, that's a better market for us. Radiant cooling can be anywhere. So we've done projects in really hot, humid areas like Atlanta, and there are projects that are in New Orleans and Mexico and all over places you wouldn't think that radiant cooling would be a good idea because people are always very concerned about condensation. So that's one of the things that we address in our training is how to get past the condensation worries. A lot of our listeners may be familiar with radiant cooling. I think radiant heating is just like a very logical thing. It's like a radiator. You're just broadcasting and releasing energy to a cooler space. But cooling, describe how that works. What are the major components for radiant cooling? So really, it's the exact same thing. We're just reversing the process. So an example that I like to use is as you walk through a supermarket and you walk down the frozen foods aisle, you may feel a little bit colder. The air temperature is probably the exact same as the air temperature in the cereal aisle. You're just next to a bunch of very cold surfaces. So the walls, the freezers next to you are very cold. So they're sponging your heat energy away from you. And what we do with radiant cooling is just a less intense version of that. So we just cool the floor or sometimes the ceiling a little bit to take some of the sensible heat load out of the building back to a chiller or a geo exchange heat pump or something like that and cool it down again. So same network of PEX pipe embedded in a surface. We're just using cool water instead of hot water in the summer. And you mentioned the condensation topic. How do you deal with that? So the good news is that there are a lot of things that are working in our favor at this point, just as far as building codes go. So our favorite projects are going to be commercial new construction for a few different reasons. Part of the reason is that they're going to have a nice tight envelope. They're going to have a control system that's going to be able to work with the temperature and the humidity sensors that we would need to operate the system properly. And they're hopefully following ASHRAE standards 55, which is thermal environmental conditions for human occupancy. And then also ASHRAE standard 62.1 ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality in commercial buildings. So the reason that I mentioned those is that if you follow those rules, those ASHRAE standards, and then just modern building practices, you don't have an issue with condensation because you can't get the floor too cold or you would break the guidelines of ASHRAE standard 55. And then you also wouldn't have humidity issues. You wouldn't have a room that's so swampy that it would start to sweat either because then you'd be breaking the ASHRAE 62.1 guidelines. So that's helped us a ton because it's not our special rules for building construction. It's just like, do what you're doing normally. And then we kind of avoid the conditions where you would develop sweat on the floor. And then we also know that there are some specific rooms in a building that like a commercial kitchen, we'd probably stay away from that because they can have just an enormous amount of pasta pots boiling all of a sudden. And that's a pretty quick load change. So we would just like stay out of that the same way that we keep radiant heating out of pantries. So you don't have your potatoes continuing to grow (laughs) in your pantry. So it's really the proper application comes in the harmony of human comfort and building science. Yeah. And that's what is exciting about it for me is that we really think that this is the best delivered product from a comfort standpoint. So what we used to do in the past with radiant heating is we said, okay, 
we're in a big fight with forced air. You should throw your furnace out and you should put in a boiler and do radiant heating. You don't need a furnace at all. That used to work in a residential space where you had plenty of infiltration for fresh air. That's not really the story anymore with a big commercial building where you're going to need mechanical ventilation just to make sure that you've got enough fresh air into the space. So now instead of fighting with the forced air crowd to say, we do it better, we're more comfortable, what we think the best delivered product is, is going to be a hybrid system where you have a forced air component that can be downsized. So you're not doing two redundant systems, but traditionally we go with the DOAS, a dedicated outdoor air system combined with radiant cooling, and it's the perfect match for us. So we can still keep the humidity levels in check, bring in fresh air, but then drive most of the sensible loads with the radiant floors. So then you have a nice cool surface in the summer instead of just turning down the temperature of the air that you're blowing around. Got it. So where is Rehau based globally? Globally, we started in Rehau, Germany. That's the name of the town. And we still have a bunch of production facilities there. We have about 20,000 employees worldwide. 8,000 of them are in Germany. And then the rest of us are spread out across 55 other countries, I think. So we're all over the place in different parts of the world. We make different things. We'll make hoses or furniture, edge banding or window profiles, things for Boeing occasionally too. So all sorts of different products. If it's something that can be injection molded or extruded, that's the type of product that we like to work with. Have you had a chance to visit any of the factories yet? So the only factories that I've been to are the ones we have one in Coleman, Alabama. That's where we make the pipe that we sell across the Americas. And then I've been to our plant in Celaya, Mexico, where we do some automotive and windows production now. So pretty cool. The most impressive plants that I've heard of are where we make our fittings in Germany. And they've described it as like a clean room, almost like we're making scalpels for the <laughs> medical industry or something like that, that the first human hands that would touch a fitting of ours would be the contractor at the job site. So all of that production, packaging, testing is done with robots. So that's a fun trip I've heard, but I haven't had the opportunity to go over there yet. So are there any common myths that need to be busted here with regard to using PEX? I think that there are still some holdouts as far as people think that PEX diminishes the trade in some areas, that using copper is really a more skilled trade and that anybody can go to Home Depot and use PEX and put fittings together. We do pride ourselves on making our fitting system easier with our Everlock Plus fitting and our RAUPEX pipe is easy to navigate because it's really flexible. But you can absolutely make it look bad. <laughs> so just switching the material doesn't make you or break you as far as being a skilled contractor. So unfortunately, there are people out there that don't take the care to line things up and do the same practices that they would do with copper, and it looks messy. So I think that that sometimes gives flexible pipe a bad name, but it is just as artistic as copper or lead before that or whatever. So it's a better fit for us. It's craftsmanship, yeah. Yeah, that you could give a someone who's a craftsman any fitting and uh, piping system and they would make it look nice. And then the reason that we like the PEX is that you can embed it in concrete, <laughs> that there were some very early radiant heating systems and snowmelt systems that use threaded wrought iron. First of all, that sounds like the least fun thing that you could possibly do to make like a <laughs> mesh, a grid of radiant heating with threaded pipe like that, where we can just weave it through the concrete. Those systems didn't last that long. Lovettsville was one of the early planned communities to use radiant, but the concrete attacked the iron and they leaked. So those systems ended up failing where the PEX pipe is friendly with the concrete, basically. So that's another reason that we use it. It's easier to do the application and it's a better suited material to be embedded in concrete. So Obviously, PEX is a plastic or polymeric material, so the likelihood of corrosion is just about gone. But how about things like burst strength versus copper? Just some things like that to give people some idea about the testing and development that goes into the product. Sure. So we do a fun test at our plant in Coleman, Alabama, that we will have contractors take a piece of our pipe, and then we tell them to beat it up. So we'll give them like a foot of half-inch pipe, and we tell them to just 
they can drag it across sharp edges. They can take something to it and grind at it. We've got different like sandpaper and abrasive things that basically simulate job site conditions. Hopefully nobody ever damages a piece of pipe as they put it in by scratching it across something sharp. But we know that job site conditions are very different from lab conditions. So we'll have people beat it up as long as they don't poke a hole completely through it or something like that. And then we'll fill it with water. We'll plug both ends and we hook it up to, we'll plug one end and we hook it up to this pressure test device that we have that like ASTM uses for pressure testing. We have a few of those on site at our plant, fill it with water. We put it in a tank of water and then we increase the pressure until the pipe bursts. So what we would normally see in a plumbing or heating application is that you would rarely have a situation that you'd be over 100 PSI. We've had some pieces of pipe that didn't burst until close to 1000 PSI. So we're proud of being overqualified for plumbing and heating applications. We'll have people ask us to do refrigerant or brake lines or different things like that. And we can hit some of those numbers, but just to be safe, we list what we're required to for ASTM for the pipe but we're really prepared for a surge or something like that within reason. I always, I mean, I think that the legal department here is probably a red light goes off anytime I say that our pipe is qualified to go to those higher pressures. So don't install your systems like that. Sure. I think I hear your cell phone vibrating now. Yeah. (laughs) Someone's found it on the door, but that's something that we build into the product. And since we've been doing it for so long, we're just really consistent at building the pipe like that. So you mentioned a couple of standards, ASTM, ASHRAE standards, et cetera. Do you study the standards? Do you participate in the committees? Do you have someone on the team that does? How does that work? We do. Yeah, we are a part of different groups, like uh, technical committees. I Myself, I'm not on those committees, but other people that I work with in our engineering department will go to the PPI meetings and ASTM, NSF, ASHRAE, technical committee for snow and ice melt chapters and things like that are different parts of the industry that we participate in. And the time we're recording here is just shortly after the AHR Expo. I imagine you guys had a booth there. So we didn't have a booth there this year. We walked the show and it was actually kind of fun to do a lot more market research and meet with our customers and things like that. And it was a second Southern city in a row. So we'll be back for the show in uh, Chicago. That's our favorite market. But we were there learning this time, which was more fun than just standing in the booth the entire time. Sure. And wait, waiting for people to come. What trade shows does Ray Howe attend? So ASHRAE is usually our big show. And then we do all sorts of regional shows, CMPX and SciFix West and stuff in Canada, as well as all of our salespeople have a mix of regional shows that they go to. Okay. And as, in terms of resources for follow-up, if someone wanted to learn more about the product, some of the applications, things like that, where's a good place they could go? Sure. So the campaign that we're running right now is based on schools. That's our favorite application for radiant heating, radiant cooling, and plumbing as well. So na.rayhow.com backslash schools, you can find a lot more information. And some of my favorite projects are there. Like we have a University of Chicago project that we did radiant heating and radiant cooling in a dorm, a residence hall. And this building is using 41% less energy than the average dorm in, in Chicago. And it's a beautiful studio gang architecture project, HB DMS, I believe is the engineering firm that worked on it. And they were looking at all the sensors and do all of this additional commissioning stuff well above and beyond to make sure the system's working well and tweaking it. And it's been a nice success for us there. And it even has operable windows, which in humid Chicago in the summer seems like a terrible idea, but they figured out a way to build into their controls package that if a student opens the window, they just don't get cooling anymore. So you wouldn't have the ability to flood the room with humid air and have cooling at the same time. And that has worked well. It was something that we were crossing our fingers that the controls package worked, but it did. And they were paying attention to it and things like that break some of the stereotypes about radiant cooling not being able to work in more flexible job sites like that. Because on the surface, a dormitory is something that probably scares away a lot of people, but we can figure out how to do it. Sure. And that goes back to the point of harmony with understanding building science, understanding occupants, and then putting in controls that make sense for that to really optimize the use of the system. And for that particular site, the students didn't have anything to break 
in the room <laughs> because other than the thermostat, I guess it was just the embedded in the concrete. It was actually a tab system. So it heats and cools up and down. So it's uninsulated on both the ceiling and the floor of this multi-story project. So there was a heating system in that room, but you can't tell because it just looks like concrete. So just so people are aware, na.rehau.com forward slash schools. That's it. Yeah. I want to make sure they got that right. Hex almost seems like a name like Kleenex, which seems like you've dominated the market all this time and the brand has stuck. Are there competitors out there? And do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, there are all sorts of competitors in the PEX market now. There are people that make different grades of PEX, basically. A is what we sell. That's the Engel method that we think is the best mix of flexibility and cross-linking and durability and things like that. And then there are other grades, PEX B and PEX C, that are on the market. And they are all pipes that will hold water. And I think that sometimes we get carried away with which version of PEX is superior. I personally think that the PEX A that we make is, but it comes down to support after that. There are a lot of people that can make Kleenex. There are a lot of people that can make tissue paper, but to be able to tackle a project on the scale of the University of Chicago or University of Washington or some of these other big school projects that we've worked with, the pipe is what we put in the concrete and we trust that it's going to be a good system. But the value add is just in our personnel. That's where we really shine. Yeah. I can tell just by talking with you that you're a really good representative for the company. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and times 20,000, that's like an awesome support structure right there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm the newbie as far as radiant systems with Rayhow goes that one of the cool things about our company with construction in North America is that some of my coworkers have been here for 20 plus years in the manufacturing sector is, is pretty impressive that some of the other shows, like when you go to the AHR show, if you find a booth full of people that have been there more than five years, sometimes that's a pretty good sign that like that's a stable company. So we've had really long track records with these guys and girls who work for our company. So they know our products well, they know the applications well. And that's the reason that we feel confident going after these bigger projects. So just like a personal interface here, I'm building a high performance house. My wife and I are building it now and we're using passive house windows. It's not a passive house, but we're using passive house windows and yep. it just rang a bell the manufacturer of Antana is using Ray Howe framing and sash. The funny thing about Ray Howe is for as many products that we produce, one of the very few that we write our name all over is the PEX pipe, but then we bury it in concrete or we <laughs> put it behind a wall for plumbing or whatever. So kind of the same thing with windows that they make the profiles, they make the straight lengths and then different fabricators will cut those and miter them together and build their own version of the windows or a raw material supplier, I guess, the raw lineal for the windows industry as well in North America. That's cool. Glad you've got some nice windows in your house as well. And we have PEX plumbing. I haven't looked at it yet to see what brand it is, but I'll check it out for sure. Next time I get in there, it's still under construction. <laughs> Sounds good. Covered a lot of different topics here today and really wanted to introduce the Building HVAC Science audience to this concept. And it's not just simply a pipe. It's not just simply a material. There really is a lot of thoughtfulness that goes behind it. And again, this harmony with building science, human interaction with the building and controls, that's really what we're all about talking about is creating more comfortable, healthier, and safer environments for people to live in. So that's why you're here. So any closing thoughts as we wrap up here today? Yeah, I think to that point that what we do best with radiant heating and radiant cooling is meet all the criteria of the built environment and making the places, the indoor air quality that you're expecting, the comfort that you're expecting. And when we do our job correctly, you don't know about any of that. And that's one of the tricky things about marketing radiant heating and cooling is that when it works well, you don't see it, you don't hear it, you don't know that it's happening, you just are comfortable. So that's a harder thing to put on a flyer than some other unique selling propositions that other companies or other products and applications may have. But that's when we shine is when we meet all those criteria and fit into modern construction to make people happy and comfortable in their spaces. You'd be happiest if people don't know you're there. That's the best. I used to sell boilers. And if a homeowner knows what type of boiler they have, it's probably because it's broken a bunch of times. Yeah. If they think that their heating system is Honeywell, or nest or something like that. That's great because that means they haven't been down to the mechanical room to fix anything 
or see what's wrong if they know the specific brand model serial number of their boiler were in trouble. <laughs> Fantastic. I want to thank you, Max, for speaking with us today uh, and telling us all about Ray Howe. And I look forward to meeting you face to face sometime in the future. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast with Max Rohr describing to us how to market invisible performance with products from Ray Howe. If you like what you heard today and not subscribed to the podcast, please consider doing so by typing Building HVAC Science into the search bar of any typical podcast app. If you have any messages or questions for me, you can write me at bill at truetechtools.com. If you want to keep up with other things we find interesting, follow both True Tech Tools or Building HVAC Science on Facebook. Thanks for listening today. We'll be back at you again with another episode of the Building HVAC Science Podcast. Take care.